Hi everyone, welcome to GM Arunchas channel. In this video, we'll discuss the opening, the Nimzo Indian Defense. In this video, I want to talk about two aspects. Number one, the origins of the Nimzo Indian, how this variation came into being, and number two, the strategic idea behind this opening. And to start with, the origins. According to my database, I see that this game, this variation was first played in 1851 by relatively two unknown players and uh, until the beginning of the 20th century, until the arrival of Aaron Nimzovich, who was one of the strongest players of his time, he mainly used this and uh, he popularized this opening and hence we have this name, the Nimzo Indian Defense, named after the player who popularized it, Aaron Nimzovich. Why this is uh, necessary, why it was necessary to bring in uh, the Nimzo Indian was, um, I think players around that time were genuinely believing that the chess was nearing an end. Even uh, the great Capablanca once predicted that chess wouldn't survive until like 1970 or 1980. But we are in 2020 right now and uh, well, the game is going strong even today. And uh, because of several openings that they played at their time, uh, they had very limited opening options and uh, there were like so many unknown openings at the time which were little explored or which were also considered as not so great openings, which were considered a mistakes. But Nimzo Indian, on the other hand, it, it comes under the hyper-modern theory. The point is, Black is fighting for the center with his bishop. He is ready to give away the bishop for the knight. And in return, he's trying to create a doubled pawn in White's camp, which is going to be a permanent damage in White's pawn structure. So, to understand its strategic ideas, number one, with bishop to b4, it's pretty clear that black is willing to give away the bishop for the knight, which in general is considered uh, not the great idea to begin with in the early stage of the game. You're not supposed to give away a bishop for the knight because... Uh, if your opponent manages to open up the position, in general, the bishops can become more stronger than the knights. The general understanding is that the bishops are stronger in open positions and uh, the knights are stronger in closed positions. So, with this, I think one thing becomes clear. If the exchange takes place uh, with this bishop versus knight, so if black achieves bishop takes c3 at any given point of time, then a very clear imbalance is created, which is probably one of the necessities for the black players uh, to play this opening. Where, uh, one player is able to outplay the other player because of this understanding. When, when the other player doesn't really understand the crux of this strategic idea, things can go wrong uh, pretty fast. So when I say the crux is, like, if black opens up the position after giving away the bishop, when the position opens up, obviously white's bishops can become more stronger and they are going to be uh, a real trouble for black side. On the other hand, since black has the knights in the position, and if the position remains closed, obviously the bishops are going to find a hard time to really get activated, and basically there's nothing much can be done with the bishop. Let's see one of the games uh, that was played by Aaron Nimzovich, uh, where he showed a very good idea, a very good game, where, uh, I mean, also some help from his uh, opponent, where uh, he allowed black to close the position completely and fail to create any counterplay. Let's get started. So bishop b4, the starting point of the Nimzo, which Nimzo Indian defense. White continued with uh, an opening that was pretty popular at that time. e3, which is also called as the Rubinstein defense, Rubinstein variation, which was uh, uh, named after another great player, Rubinstein, who popularized this uh, against the Nimzo Indian. They continue to the natural developing moves and uh, c5, knight c6, castle. And today we know this variation as the Hubner variation, where uh, black gives away the bishop for the knight. And as you can see, in return, uh, white's pawn structure is compromised. On the other hand, uh, black is trying to build. A center control with the spawns in the dark squares. Now, until now, this is all uh, mainstream theory. 
the general idea is obviously if white uh, opens up the position especially the bishop the bishop on c1 can become like really strong and if that happens most probably white will be like clearly better now black continued with b6 making sure there is no opening up of the position and if white wishes to take on c5 black can take it back and uh, white's pawn structure still remains bad and the position still doesn't open up and uh, the bishops are still finding a very difficult time to get active and at this point uh, the modern theory suggests white to go with f4 and expand on the king side and begin the attack as quickly as possible in this game white player went with uh, knight b3 probably he was preparing for uh, e4 at this point he wanted to defend the d4 pawn uh, there are two attackers in this position and uh, e4 then the d4 pawn might fall so knight b3 and black continued with e5 here uh, arises a very interesting moment f4 was played by white white understands the need to open up the position and immediately st uh, strikes in the center with this side pawn the f pawn with f4 if black takes on d4 for example if things like this happen if white can separate his pawn structure this is exactly what white wants in this case white has a strong central pawn pawn structure where uh, he will start advancing the pawns right now not to forget if the bishop becomes active this bishop is going to be the a monster this is going to be the reason of black's loss and this is going to be the main advantage for white uh, to convert this game into a win black uh, understands this and decides to keep the position closed and continued with e4 and uh, white reacted to this with uh, bishop to e2 now let's talk about uh, black strategy so far things have gone very well according to the strategical ideas black has managed to keep the center closed and there is no immediate way for white to open up the position and as long as the center is closed bishops especially the bishop on c1 cannot really become active and unless white activates the bishop on c1 this whole structure it's just never going to be really good for white now with bishop e2 white has a very clear idea to start expanding on the king side with g4 followed by bishop e1 bishop e1 bishop can find itself uh, in an active diagonal in near future after this and uh, it's important to understand uh, uh, from black's perspective that white white should not be allowed to play this specific plan where uh, white will definitely have an advantage because it's not once white starts playing g4 g5 it's not entirely clear where exactly black will have to f play because if we don't have a central pawn break we don't have much prospects on the queen side as well so it's important to stop white's counterplay and uh, black came up with a fantastic idea queen to d7 as you can see uh, h5 is not available for black because bishop takes h5 is still hanging and uh, if you understand it there is no other way for black to really stop g4 so queen d7 an original move um, but it's all the purpose White continued with uh, h3, again uh, getting ready to expand on the king side with g4, so far all good. Black played knight e7, obviously uh, black cannot stop this g4 move anymore and uh, black is basically trying to reroute his knight to the king side because once g4 happens he can definitely expect a, a strong attack. So more pieces on the king side makes sense. At the same time, some knight g6, knight h4 kind of ideas can also be possible in the near future. Now g4 should have been the correct way to continue for white, where uh, the game is still double-edged. Um, it's still not very clear uh, who exactly has a advantage after that, but still, it's a unclear position. But this is where white loses uh, the basic plot. He, he doesn't understand what exactly is going on and uh, makes a poor move at this point with queen e1. Uh, maybe it was because uh, he probably thought knight f5, knight g3 can be annoying or knight g6, knight h4 can be uh, irritating for white and hence decided to 
cover up these squares with the queen before playing g4. But that's the problem because of this move, black are choose h5. Now, basically, white cannot expand on the king side. White's pawns are stopped in the center. And obviously, there is nothing much going on on the uh, queen side as well. And now, uh, the position has remained closed. Obviously, the bishops are going to have a hard time. White played bishop d2. I mean, it's just a normal move, nothing special. And black came up with an excellent plan. Black understood that there is no real prospects for white on the queen side or in the center. And the game is going to take place on the king side. That is where the battle is going to take place pretty soon. And uh, decided to transfer his queen from the queen side to the king side with queen f5. With the idea of queen h7. Now the point is, black is expecting the h file or the g file to open up in the near future. And uh, the presence of the queen on the king side is definitely going to come in handy for him. White played a4. Black brings out his pieces with knight f5. With knight f5, black can also prepare for h4. In this case, the g3 square is going to become a square weakness. And at some point, king h8 followed by rook g8 and g5. Black can open up the position and uh, a big attack is expected. Understandably, white stopped this with g3. And uh, black stopped white's counter chances on the queen side with a5. Now there is basically no counterplay for white on the queen side or in the center. Now the game is going to take place only on the king side where white is unable to achieve the g4 pawn break because of this spin. And on the other hand, see how black generates counterplay with knight at 6 stopping g4 once and for all followed by and here comes the important plan. So rook c8 keeping a watch on the c4 pawn at the same time the bishop is watching the a4 pawn. Now keeping the whole queen side under control and after this white starts the attack on the I'm sorry black starts the attack on the king side. King h8. The point is black is preparing for rook g8 followed by g5. Now if we stop at this point um, we will try to understand uh, what exactly happened in the game. As I mentioned earlier, the strategic idea for black is to keep the game closed as much as possible because white still has the bishop pair. And uh, as long as the position is going to be closed, the knights are going to be stronger. And we see that strategically, whatever black wanted has happened in this game so far. And white hasn't found a clear plan for himself or uh, a clear plan to activate his uh, bishops either. Now, black has a clear plan of action with rook g8, g5, whereas white is left without any clear plan. Knight d2, rook g8, followed by g5. Well, um, we can understand it this way. Basically, strategically, the game was already over. Uh, black's strategy has been a tremendous success so far. And uh, white has basically lost the plot and uh, basically left without a clear plan. And from here, when a strong player handles this game from Black's perspective, I would say more or less the game is already over. The rest is just mere execution. Um, you have all the pieces in the right spot. You have all the advantages it can ask for. And from here, okay, you have to be careful with the tactical aspects. Watch out for clear tactical ideas. When things are in the right spot, strike and you will definitely find the win. This is what pretty much happened in the game. And F1 and doubling up of the rooks. So white is mobilizing all his pieces on the king side to defend and black's mobilizing all the pieces on the king side to attack. But usually pieces that are defending are much more passive and usually it, 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 is, it doesn't work that way. The attacking pieces are way more stronger and one way or the other they will find a way to get a breakthrough. Queen d1 and uh, yeah, here uh, black opens up the position. And... Uh, I'm sure there are several other ways to continue, but black found uh, the bishop on d7 to be uh, not immediately involving in the attack and hence decided to activate it via a6 to keep a watch on the c4 pawn. And if bishop takes c4, the d5 pawn also can, will be hanging. But if you notice in the overall uh, uh, game, like if you think about it, every other piece is fine except for the bishop on c1. If you see the bishop on c1 didn't really... Uh, 
do anything, didn't have any role in the whole game. The game ended in another few moves with uh, rookie 2 and here uh, the final blow occurs. Knight h4. Now, obviously, uh, because of this pen, white cannot take the knight on h4 and uh, black is preparing to start the attack with bishop c8 with the idea of bishop on h3. I think I mentioned this in one of our earlier videos as well. When you have all the pieces in the right spot, that's usually the clue. You have to start attacking with sacrifices. Then you have to start looking for all the all sorts of sacrifices in the position, like literally throwing all the pieces at your opponent's king one way or the other, open up the position and start the attack with forcing moves, you should be able to control the game. Queen c2, and here bishop on h3 happened. And uh, king takes h3 is met with a forcing uh, win, which ends in a checkmate. I'll leave that to you guys to calculate and find it. And uh, Bishop takes e4 was the final move with bishop f5. And uh, yeah, I think uh, white's counterplay ended at this point and uh, whatever was uh, left was just mere execution. That's it. h4, the, the position opens up completely at this point. With the idea of uh, knight h4 or uh, rook h7, queen h1 should checkmate. And that's where the game ended. At this point, uh, the white player resigned. I'm sure like, uh, there are like several ways to conclude this. I'll leave that to the viewers. So I think uh, this game gives us a very clear understanding about uh, the importance of the strategical aspects. When one side plays according to the demands of the position and the other side is losing the crux and uh, when strategically everything goes wrong, well, this can be the outcome. So I think uh, this is clear with this Nimzo Indian. Uh, this is one of the earliest games. So when we study the Nimzo Indian, I thought it makes sense to start with the player who uh, basically popularized this opening. So it's also a tribute to a great player, Nim Aaron Nimzovich, because of whom we have Nimzo Indian as a, uh, a common opening these days. Okay, I'm not sure if uh, without Nimzo Indian, I mean, without Nimzo, which we will have this Nimzo Indian opening. But anyways, uh, we have this beautiful opening. So if you are going to play Nimzo Indian, understand these basic points in your game, whether you're playing white or not, or uh, white or black, it doesn't matter. So these are the general ideas. And uh, while you're making decisions, use these strategic understanding and make your decisions. I'm sure you should be able to come out well. And uh, I think this is uh, pretty much it for today's video. And uh, if you guys need any other openings, if you have uh, any other suggestions, please let me know in the comments. And I'll see you all in the next video then. Bye-bye.